And that brings us to the weekly analysis, and that means Mark Shields and Ramesh Panuro, syndicated columnist Mark Shields and Ramesh Panuro of the National Review. David Brooks is away. Hello to both of you. Judy. Hi. So let's pick up, Mark, on what we just heard in Lisa's report, what's been going on all this week, this, this um, series of disagreements between Speaker Pelosi and a group of uh, newly elected women, Democratic members of the House. Uh, they've been called the Quad Squad. Uh, what do you make of this? How serious a split is this? It's, it's serious, uh, Judy, in that, that it represents a profound change in our politics. When I came to Washington shortly after the cooling of the earth, there was a, a, a rule that you didn't get to learn any freshman member's name until he or she had won a second term. Um, because they, that was what their first term was about, was learning the place, uh, learning uh, what they're supposed to do, and then getting reelected. That is no longer the case. I mean, uh, uh, AOC comes in with 4.7 million Twitter followers. Um, so she doesn't need the traditional means of communicating, going to a press release or talking on, uh, even on, on television. She's just available. So it, it's, a, it's a real, I mean, it's not, politics is the most imitative of all human art forms with the possible exception of political journalism. <laughs> Donald Trump showed that tweeting gets you directly to voters that you can bypass traditional media. That's what these people are doing. I just wish that the four members of the mod squad had ever served in the minority mm -hmm. and known mm -hmm. for eight years what it was like and the effort, energy, talent, and skill of Nancy Pelosi and, and, and her, her people who worked with her to win back the majority after eight years. And they're accusing her of being too not liberal uh, enough. Yeah. Ramesh Panera, how do you read this? Well, I think there are two different voter bases going on here. Nancy Pelosi has remarked that she and um, these members are in deep blue, solidly Democratic districts where a room temperature glass of water with a D after its name could win the election. But most of the Democrats who won the swing districts that made the Democrats a majority, they're in moderate districts. They can't take the same positions. And you add to that, they don't have the Senate. So there's always going to be frustrations when legislation passes the House and then doesn't get anywhere in the Senate. We had a loss for the Democrats on immigration, and part of what's going on here is a blame game where people can't just accept mm. you've got one half of one of the three branches of government. There's just sometimes you're going to make you're going to take some losses. You're referring to that vote uh, a few days ago on money for the border, wherein Speaker Pelosi, as as uh, Lisa reported, Mark, uh, yeah. ended up going along no, uh, with Republicans. Exactly. And I just picking up on, on Ramesh's point. Uh, you know, it's it's only what is it now, 12, uh, 15 years ago since Barack Obama electrified uh, the political world and the, particularly the Democratic Party at the convention in Boston where he said, uh, we don't, uh, we worship an awesome God in blue America. We have gay friends in red America. There is no red United States. There, there's only the United States of America, not a blue United States. I mean, I just wonder if, if that kind of a speech and that kind of a spirit would uh, be well received uh, in this present climate of Democrats who, who are fractious, uh, divided, and I think increasingly divisive group. Is this, is this Ramesh, from your perspective, uh, is this the kind of split that lingers into next year's and, and, and infects and, and spills over into the presidential? Race. Well, I don't think that many voters are going to vote on the basis of this kind of inside baseball dispute between Democrats, especially since the, none of these members of Congress are going to be on the presidential ballot, um, the ones that we're talking about anyway. Uh, but I do think that it makes it harder for the Democrats to have a unified message where they're talking about their shared agenda and they're prosecuting the case against Trump if they're all pointing fingers at each other. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good point, Judy. I mean, the, the reality is that the, the, the Democrats, I think, are misreading the results of 2018. In, in 2010, you oh. recall, the Republicans won a stunning majority in the House, and Barack Obama was reelected two, uh, two years later. Uh, in, 2000, uh, in, uh, in 1994, Bill Clinton was crushed. Uh, and yet uh, Republicans swept into power for the first time in 40 years, and two years later he was reelected. A congressional election midterm is entirely different from a presidential election, and I don't think that's quite understood by, by some of these fractious Democrats right now. They better figure out 30 million people voted in the primaries in 2016, 135 million voted in the general, but that 30 million, uh, what is said, will be remembered 
uh, it, all the way through to the last hour in November, the first Tuesday after the first Monday, by what is said in New Hampshire, what's said in Iowa. And yeah. uh, I think Democrats would be well advised to remember that. I want to turn to President Trump, Ramesh. And uh, yesterday we were all waiting for the president to announce that uh, he was going to sign an executive action or take an executive action in order to add a citizenship question to the census. As the day wore on, we learned that the White House, the president, decided not to do that. It's complicated set of reasons. It was more, it was harder to do than they thought it was going to be. Instead, they are ordering government agencies to put out information, to share it uh, with the Commerce Department, so we know more about who's in this country without documents. Uh, it, what does this say about President Trump's efforts to go after immigrants? Uh, does it know an end? I mean, what, what else do we look for here? Well, I think it says a couple things about this administration. One, this is the biggest legal defeat that it suffered. It had a mixed legal result from the Supreme Court, but the ultimate end of it was that they didn't get their way in putting the citizenship question on the census. They ran up against the clock, and they ran up, frankly, against their own incompetence. That's the takeaway number two. The Supreme Court said, you can add a citizenship question to the census, but you've got to you know, dot the I's and cross the T's and provide us with your reasons. And that was what the administration was incapable of doing. That's, I think, what led them to this place where this basic priority, they are not able to follow through on. But do you end up in a situation, Mark, where it, it, ordering the government to turn over health records, social security records of, of individuals who may or may not be citizens, does that end up being even more invasive than rounding, I mean, than asking them to answer this question? Potentially so, Judy, but I think it was a stinging defeat and rebuke of the president. Um, and the president does not admit defeat. I mean, I think this was a, a way out. I mean, the president took a stinging defeat last November. We turn, learned today it was Paul Ryan's fault that the Republicans uh, suffered uh, loss of the House in November of 2018. Uh, the closing of the government. Uh, that, that wasn't uh, a defeat for the president. So he can't accept that it is a, a defeat. I, I think all of this, uh, quite frankly, uh, to, to look at it in a very uncharitable way is nothing but a fear campaign uh, to intimidate uh, people uh, from the cens census um, and uh, therefore to lead to an undercount. A fear campaign? Well, look, I think that there's an open question about whether congressional districts can be drawn based on voting eligible population or votes based on total population. And obviously what Republicans want to do is draw the lines according to the, the voting eligible population because that will increase their representation in Congress. But that's, that's the what, real motive. That but they weren't willing to say it and defend it openly in court. And I, again, I think that that's why we ended up with this this alternative, which, as you point out, does have some privacy implications that are troubling. The, the problem is the Constitution. I mean, there's not anything about voting age population in the in the Constitution. Well, the Supreme Court has left it open whether. No, so, but, so I, we'll, but I think we'd it's, have to it's see. pretty clear we're talking about in a census. We're talking about the number of people, and at, at the same time, we've got a number of social programs, the, the formula of which is based upon right. the people of, of, who need it in an area. If you're living next door. Uh, to people, and you need, uh, and your family is in, qualifies for, and needs for, and you're denied it because somehow they're undercounted, uh, and you, your district. I mean, that's unjust, and 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 the final analysis, inhumane. Well, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of federal money that is tied to these sorts of numbers, so the stakes are very high. Quickly circle back to the Democrats, to the presidential race. We had some movement in the presidential race this week. Uh, Mark, uh, Eric Swalwell, the congressman, got out. The billionaire hedge fund manager, Tom Steyer, who's Mr. Impeachment, he's the one who's run millions of dollars of ads uh, advocating the impeachment of the president, is in. He's now running. Uh, this comes in the same week that Bernie Sanders issues his, announces his anti-endorsements, billionaires and millionaires who he says he doesn't want their endorsement. How much money does, how much difference does money make in 2019 in American politics? It is the mother's milk of American <laughs> politics, Still. as Jess Unruh said. And uh, it, as Mark Hanna said, there are two things that matter in American politics, money, and I can't remember the second one. Um, and there's no question about it. And obviously the number of people who contribute, 65,000 or 130,000 in September, uh, contribute as necessary to get on the stage in the Democratic debate. So it is, it, it, it is important. And whether you can hire people, run a campaign, 
and, and all the rest of it. As far as Bernie Sanders, he's just borrowing a page from Grover Cleveland, who's, <laughs> who's uh, nominating uh, speech at the 1884 convention was, we love him most for the enemies he has made. And to, th therefore, to identify the special interests, the big money that is opposed to you and to thereby give you a virtue. And I, I think it's a totally legitimate uh, strategy on Bernie Sanders' part. You know, the... Money obviously matters. There's a reason politicians spend so much time raising it. But there are so many past candidates who have been big spenders and not gone all That's the way. True. John Connolly in 1980, right. Bill Graham in 96, mm -hmm. um, Jeb Bush in the 2016 mm -hmm. cycle. I think so if you're Tom Steyer, it's not going to be the money that determines whether he wins or not. It may be a prerequisite, but he, what he's got to show is that he's got a message that takes off. And maybe being an impeachment obsessive will be what does it. Maybe enough Democrats will be frustrated by inaction on that front that they'll rally to him. But that, I think, is the question. Is, is whether impeachment, uh, Mark, is the, is, is the cachet that, that can get him if it not is, just into the, the debate. Democrats but... have just written the longest suicide note in the history of American politics, if that's the case, Judy. Speaking of billionaires, we want to finally remember someone uh, who ran for president twice back in the 1990s, Ross Perot. Mm -hmm. He died this week. Uh, Mark, he, he was remembered as somebody who talked about deficits and standing there with his charts. Some of us who covered those campaigns right. remember it well. What is his legacy? His, his legacy is not to be confused with any other billionaires who have run for the office. He, he was sui generis, and, and he, quite frankly, in 1992, ran a campaign, Judy, that forced the two parties uh, to confront the national debt. Um, if you recall, that from, nine, from the founding of the country to 1980, nine wars, one depression, would run up a total in debt of $1 trillion. In 12 years of supply-side economics under Reagan and Bush, we had quadrupled that. And Ross Perot said, you've got to do something about it. It's unfair to your children and your grandchildren. Democrats didn't want to go near it because they were dying to get back in to get the keys to the Treasury. Republicans didn't want to touch it because they acknowledged it happened on their watch. That Bill Clinton was forced, basically, by Ross Perot's persuasiveness to address it. And with the only, only balanced budgets in the past half century since World War II with Bill Clinton's uh, as a consequence of that. And Only a little more than 30 seconds. The strongest third party showing uh, right. in the last 100 years, in part because of that. I think the other thing that comes to mind is whatever disagreements one had with Ross Perot, he was not running for himself. He was not running for fame. He was not running for fortune. He was running as a patriot who had serious concerns about his country's future. And that, I think, is something to admire. Amen. And on that note, we thank you both, Ramesh Panuru and Mark you. Shields. Thank you.